Hey there, it's Tyson Sharp here, and if you're looking to get in your zone of genius, especially when it comes to the world of business, but you might have some doubts, some fears, some worries about how do I actually do that, this is the episode for you. Let's dive in. Okay. My online family, welcome back to another episode of the Awaken Your Business podcast. As you just heard, we have Deborah here. And the reason why I think this is important is because we're all driven to lead our lives in some way. And whether that's your inner calling that says you need to do this, and whether that's beating down on your door until you take that leap, or whether you're running a team for your business, whether it be a team for your family, Whatever it is, we always have to interact with other people and we always, have to, uh, we always have to do it in a very, very awakened, conscious way in order for us to follow our heart and to live more in truth of who and what we are. And what I find is that a lot of people aren't really listening to that. And so the tools, tactics, strategies, advice that Deborah can share about how to live from a more conscious place, more awakened place, especially in the form of leadership, is not only going to result in more outcomes for your business, but also obviously more awakened in terms of peace and love and joy within your own life. So this is the conversation we're having. Deborah, thank you so much for being here. It's an absolute pleasure. How are you doing? Oh, Tyson, thank you so much. I'm so excited and I am great, full of energy and ready to just share and meet you where you're at and your awesomeness and your wisdom and just have a, a fun discussion, a joyful, okay. enlightening discussion. Hopefully that's where, that's where we like to go. But here's the also thing. <laughs> we also just see where it goes. If we see where it exactly. goes, we trust no matter what, what, what comes out of our mouth, it's, it's what the listener needs. And so if you're listening, be prepared to go on a journey. Deborah's can That's share a little bit about her story, but then yeah. whatever happens from there happens. And no doubt there are going to be some takeaways, some nuggets you want to write down uh, so you can live a more conscious, a conscious life. And uh, one that obviously you call as, as conscious leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. So give us an understanding about who you are, about your story. How did you get to doing what you do in the, in the corporate world mm -hmm. and in, in coaching teams and helping them, helping them lead more consciously? Yeah, thank you. So yeah, it's kind of funny because who would have thunk that I would have been here? So um, the long and short of it, I have this crazy mind that wants to like achieve, 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 I think like many do. And I learned from a young age that um, I got little gold stars when I achieved and I got to move to the next level and people noticed me and it felt good. It felt good being first chair violinist. It felt good being a, you know, track star. It felt great having high academics. And I realized, um, that it was never enough. I didn't know that really. Um, and I was pretty brave at doing things and I, learned to do that because at home, it wasn't a safe place for me. I didn't have love really from my family. I didn't really feel protected and safe there. So I learned at a young age to gain it outside of my family. And that was the way I did it. And so I climbed my way up. I climbed my way up to this and that and to this college and then to working at this corporation and blah, 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 blah. And had a lot of accolades, meaning news media noticing me. And I also realized that I was very naturally athletic and I wanted to start racing my bike at age 42. Typically cyclists do not start at age 42 racing their bike, but I'm like, what the heck? Cause I always thought I actually failure was never in my vocabulary. Just kind of crazy. So it wasn't, I didn't have that fear. I just would keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. And I think it's because I lived a fearful life. I think I ignored that. And I will wrap that up at the end because there is learning and wisdom and fear. And I ignored that. So as a cyclist, um, of course, guess what? My crazy said, well, you be, need to be number one, even though I was like age 42. So my first year of racing, I was number two out of 998 women. 
um, in the United States. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I just kept moving up in my, my ranks and it was going to be almost eight years ago on June 1st, 2013, I was in a race, my first race, pretty much for the season starting off. And I thought, Oh, I feel pretty good. I'm think I'm going to podium today, even though it was really my B race. The last thing I remember was smiling at my friends, my family. Um, in that race, I was apparently hit by another cyclist. And when I was hit by that cyclist, I hit the curb. I cracked open my skull, even though I had a brand new helmet on. My brain bounced from the back of my head to the front of my head and started bleeding all over my brain. I crushed nine ribs. I shattered, um, I separated my shoulder and my temporal bone and my ear broke. And I started convulsing apparently. I was completely unaware. I was raised to a trauma one hospital and my family was called and said, we don't believe the doctors and the ER, the um, paramedics said, we don't think she's going to make it. You need to get to the hospital. So the cool thing is I had no idea this is happening. <laughs> um, and they put me in a coma, which I find funny. Um, they put me in a coma to keep my brain from swelling and to have it not activate which my brain is always very active. And during that time um, of being in the hospital, I started to wake up and they, the doctor said, we're gonna release you from the hospital, but it's gonna take three years for your brain to heal because it's highly injured. They also plated all my ribs in the hospital um, and they said, you're going to need to go to therapy. So I went to OT, PT, all this four times a week. And when I got home and lied in bed by myself, I realized that my life was called to more because I wasn't supposed to be here, but yet I was. And I called out to God, the universe, and I said, what is my purpose here? I don't want to miss it this time because I'm not supposed to be here. The doctor also, I forgot to say a very important point. The doctor also shared my neurologist when I left the hospital, he said, it will take you three years, most likely for your brain to heal because it is very injured. And because I had learned unconsciously to negate what I don't want to believe and to choose what I do want to believe, which I think also saved my life unconsciously, I said, hell no, it won't. So as I was lying in bed, back to my place of lying in bed and wondering what am I called for, um, it was about eight months after that I was back on my bike and also um, my brain wasn't fully healed, but I was back on my bike doing things I never thought I was going to be able to do as quickly as possible. And I was also driving my car. And the cool thing about driving my car was that I could take my kids to school now. And so my whole life was turned upside down and just doing the simple things like driving my kids to school or putting my clothes on or being awake. Um, and what that really means, because being in a coma, I think I really lived a life in a coma. Like I didn't think about it. I just thought achieve, 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 achieve. So when I was taking my kids to school this one day, my little girl was 11. She saw her brother getting on the train, going to, to uh, school with beautiful, wealthy people in Chicago. She says, mama, why does everyone look so unhappy getting on the train, going to work? And I was like, Oh, like I knew there was something in there and I felt my heart was really heavy and all I could do was agree with her. And I said, honey, I agree with you. You're right. But I couldn't shake what she had said. This wise 11 year old is noticing these beautiful people who have everything in the world that they could get, but they looked miserable. So I dropped her off and I went home and guess what? I went to get my bike. And just as I was about to over the same railroad tracks, I'll never forget where I was, the, my purpose came to me. And this is what I heard. Thank God you almost died doing something you love doing and you were awesome at it. These dear precious people are getting on the train, going to work, doing something they don't most wanna do. They're dying a slow death every day and they don't even realize it. I am here to wake them the hell up. That's what I 
<laughs> okay, I got my purpose now. Okay, now what? <laughs> and so, of course, when you are called, I believe, to step in, to step into yourself, to call into the reason for your being, things come to you. You don't have to go look for them. So all of a sudden I'm like reading about conscious leadership and I'm in touch with the head of conscious leadership who happened to live in Chicago. And I read the intro and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I totally believe this. I need to meet this man. Where does he live? In Chicago. So I got involved in many forums, learning about the power of being awake, noticing our head, our heart, our body, what is here for us, the whole being, what is our body telling us? What are our emotions here for us? What are they telling us? And then what are our thoughts? Since our thinking is really our last part of knowing it's very slow and we tend to override, right? Our hearts and our guts, especially in America. I don't know what it's like over there, but we tend to just be in our head all the time. And so I started to like learn, how do I have feelings? Cause I overrode all my feelings. Cause I was so much in a hurry to get things done. I didn't feel my feelings. And so I overrode so much wisdom. And then I didn't even know I had body senses, right? As a cyclist, you're just like, take a beating, take a beating, take a beating. You just do it again, do it again. But there's wisdom in our body telling us. And so my wake up was, wow, like I really have been living for someone else and or something else, or I even know who I was. And so to really start to, and I'm still learning, who am I? Who am I called to be in this now moment? And, and experiencing the feelings, I remember being terrified when I felt fear in my body because I wasn't used to feeling it. And it made me so downright uncomfortable. I would like, oh, oh. and so I realized that we build capacity when we have emotions to allowing it to be there. And it takes a little bit of time. Can I be with just a little bit of that discomfort of being fearful instead of overriding it or distracting myself and having a glass of wine or having some chocolate or calling a friend even? Can I just be with the fear and let it pass through me? That's what I started to really learn. Can I really just let the feelings pass through me? Everyone who knows me knows I'm all all for that it's just being on the emotional journey i mean you don't have to meditate in silence two hours a day like i do but to be in a to be in a space of allowing and mm -hmm. surrender to whatever emotions are coming up it's it's almost opposite of what we're taught and what we're conditioned to do but there's so many gifts in there now my mm. my question would be a lot of people can register here with that achiever phase of consistently going out and achieving and needing to do the next thing, needing to be the best, needing to do that. You just associated that with being in a coma. Oh, yeah. in, in what ways, in what ways do you see that type of life being, mm -hmm. being in a coma? Cause a lot of people who are, who are almost stuck in the achievement phase as their identity would say, that's the opposite of being in a coma. You're saying, no, it's actually, I started realizing that I'm, I was living in a coma being on that, on that treadmill. Right. Well, totally. how, how do you, how do you link those two? Yeah. So really like just as much as I shared, I wasn't even aware that I was about to die and that I must've been in horrible pain. I, I don't know, but I was completely drugged. <laughs> so not aware of my being, not aware of my purpose, not aware of why am I even here on this earth? I think I lost all of that by hearing what other people were telling me from a young age as to what success is and believing it without even questioning it. Mm. Like to me, that's being in a coma, not like, what the hell am I telling myself? What am I hearing? Do I even align with that? What is, what is like, it was like, I was put in this bubble, the U S bubble. I don't know if it's a world bubble of what success is what excellence is and striving and striving and in, in that coma bubble. Mm -hmm. And it kept me stuck and sick and healthy. In fact, I'm even going to start writing a book. It's called your excellence is killing you. <laughs> right. And, and the coma, it was killing me. It was killing me. 
it was killing me because I lost myself. Yeah. It's the opposite of living fully alive. It's something the opposite. people listening can ask themselves because we're, we're in that our ego always goes to more is better. And as Wayne Dyer <laughs> says, where, where is the peace in more is better? Right. There's just, there's no peace in that. And when you have a life that's always, I need more of this. I need more of that. I'll be more safe when I achieve this. I'll be more recognized and more seen when I do that. Um, you, you, not only is there less peace, but as you're describing, it's like there's you, you, you sort of don't get in touch with why you're actually here and who you actually are. Right. And I think, I think your story in terms of, having a childhood where you your the fear was that you're not being loved and not being seen by your family. So I need to achieve in order to be seen was a very mm-hmm. consistent pattern, which obviously reinforced into adolescence and adulthood to athletics and, and, and fitness and all those different things. And mm-hmm. so what do you think it means? What do you think the universe was showing you or telling you when you're, striving 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 trying to be the best trying to be the best trying to be the best and then bang this happens what do you think that what do you think the 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 lesson was there where's the wisdom in that the wisdom for me is that i have to love myself first the wisdom for me is that it's not out here it's not out here everything i need is in here everything i need the wisdom the love the knowing the knowledge the connection to others, it has to start here. And so I really started to develop a mantra for myself and it's love God, the universe first, love something greater, the world, love myself. And as I love myself, I will love others. And to me, I used to cry out. I'm like, I don't know what that means. And I work with CEOs and guess what? Over and over, I'll be like, Take some time for yourself to love yourself. So you're not thrown into a bed and not able to get up and take care of yourself and, and, and figure it out the hard way. Like I had learned the hard way. Like I had to really learn how to put my clothes back on and to cut my food and to learn to talk and walk again, like a baby. Like I'm given the second life guys. Don't lose it. Love yourself, love who you are. It's not doing that's going to give you the love Mm. that's going to kill you, right? It takes you away from who you are. And so I've realized that being still, like you say, meditation, being still and with whatever is here, can I be present to whatever is here and what is friendly and kind to my noticing whatever is here because of our ego, we tend to like, obviously, you know, this think of what's worse about someone else or the situation or what might be bad. And we're like, what? and so, okay. So can, and then our body locks down when we're in that space, we don't breathe fully and our muscles tighten and we're like, eh. we're defensive because we're trying to defend ourselves and we're not open. And I teach this to my, my CEOs. I'm like, so how are you going to hear someone else when you're like this? You're not open to it right? And it's an energy. You can feel when someone's not open, whether it's a relationship to your work partner or it's your wife or husband or kids, you can sense it. But most of the time, that's our coma. Most of the time we're in the, and so that's not living. And so being uncomfortable, as I said earlier, with the fear and allowing it to come through us, fear and openness versus defensiveness. Fear says caution, pay attention. If we're open and curious, coupled with fear, it says, caution, pay attention as I breathe through it and let it pass through me. So I learned that like, huh, there's something here for me. What needs to be looked at versus when we're fearful, guess what? We can't even see it because our eyes are covered because that's what adrenaline does. It covers over us and we can't see it. So I always say, breathe, with the fear, let it come through you. Fear, anxiety, stress, let it just breathe through you. Once it passes through, then you can start to look with your mind, what is here for me? If we don't feel our feelings all the way through first, we call it cognitive looping. We're gonna continue to loop the same thing over and over and over because we can't figure it out in our mind. Mm. Our, Our emotions have to tell us first, right? So I'd have to say that that's, been one of the biggest things for me is, is 
for me, fear is the opposite of love. When we're in fear, it's not very loving to ourselves, to our, our adrenaline's racing, we're storing cortisol, um, we're not open to other relationships, as I said, we're, we're in defense mode. And we, then, we always create what we don't want when we're in fear. We never get what we want when we're in fear, but yet 95% of the time, we're all in fear. So it's getting out of the coma. Can I realize I'm reacting? Can I realize I'm not listening to my whole being here? Can I take three deep breaths from the belly all the way through? Can I accept myself? That was the other thing that I learned. Accept yourself right where you're at. There's nowhere that we have to get to. We can say we want to shift and get somewhere even, oh, I better meditate. I better meditate. I did this to myself recently. I better meditate and breathe so that I'm not being reactive. That's even one step ahead. It's, can I accept myself right where I'm at? Mm. Can I just be with myself right where I'm at? I'll do anything. It's sort of the opposite of the striving. It's like, yes. right, the striving is like, I always need to be somewhere else. And as long as I'm somewhere else, exactly. And as long as I have something else, and as long as I have more, and as long as people see me in this way, it's like, it's, it's complete resistance to what is, right? It's complete resistance to what is. And I love where this is going. I can't wait for you to write this book because it's, <laughs> the, the title in and of itself helps people awaken, helps people become more conscious of your excellence is actually killing you, your, your achievement how you're moving forward and consistently going, going, going and striving, striving, striving is literally killing you. And everyone listening, my question for you would be how do people start awakening to that? If they're living their life and achievement is part of their life and they're going about their day and they're going about their career or job or business, what is, uh, how do people start awakening to the fact like, Oh, I actually might be achieving from fear. I might be in this closed off, uh, state that you're describing, how, does, how do people start to become more conscious and more aware that they might be in those patterns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure most of them, most of you all know, you can feel it when you're exhausted, when you're stressed, uh, when you fall into bed and you're like, oh my gosh, like, you know, you're in your patterns, right? You, we all have our patterns. I call them the hidden barriers, the hidden barriers that we think we're getting somewhere, but it just blocks us and keeps us safe. So Okay, so can I just notice? Noticing's everything. Can I just notice my pattern? Okay, cool. Can I appreciate myself for noticing my pattern? <laughs> cool. I can see this has gotten me so far, and it's not going to get me to be the one I want to be. Cool. Can I then go to wondering? Instead of having to figure it out, can I just be open and curious to wonder, huh? How has this pattern served me well? And can I just be open to what might be, be might, what might be even more loving to me? To get curious would be my next one. Can I just get curious? Keep breathing. Can I just get curious? What wants to happen through me? Would be an awesome question because we're always like manhandling everything. Mm. What if I don't do diddly and say, what wants to happen through me? And be still with that. Whoa, if you're asking God, the universe, that's like mega, mega beyond ourselves that we have no idea. Yeah. Wow. I think one thing that came up for me is why that's so, why that's so important is because when you say what's trying to happen through me, what's emerging through me, it's almost like it reminds you that, that in and of itself reminds you that it's not you. It's not, you're just the channel that it's flowing through you're tapping into something else. So therefore it sort of removes the ego in it and saying, this is my idea. I'm awesome. This is, this is me doing something that's, that's better than someone else. And it removes the competition. Cause you like, I, I also say this when I do podcast episodes, when I'm on zoom and I'm, I'm running these collaborative calls and things like this, I'm like, it's, it's really not even me. I can't even take credit for it. It's like, I'm just sitting here in a space of love and a space of connection and things are flowing through. I don't know where it's coming from. I just feel like it, I just feel called to share something or whatever. I can't take credit for that. 
you know, and it's yeah. sort of the ego. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what you're describing. It's like, what's trying to emerge through you in the form of ideas, in the form of, you know, synchronicities, in the form of whatever it is, you know? I, I love it. So exactly. So the, you just, this is beautiful. So love you just said love when we are in flow with what wants to happen through me, right? The world is everyone's oyster. <laughs> That's what it starts like for everyone. If we could just let it flow and the opposite, when we're in fear, it shuts the connection. Like I said earlier, it's like, uh-uh, this is mine. This is yours. This is mine. And, and, and people don't like that, but that's what we do. Yeah. Okay, so when I find myself in that place, because the ego is going to do that over and over, our, our mastery is noticing when it's there. It's not that it's not going to be there. It's not that we fixed it because the ego provides safety. For us. So we want to say, thank you, ego. And I'm more than that. I'm more than that. And asking when we are fearful, can I just give myself some more love? And love and fear are coupled together. I have found when fear takes over love, it's the protector of something that wants to be there. And it's fearful that it's not going to happen through you or for you. And so I say to my people that I coach, I'm like, huh, what is it you're most afraid of? Not afraid of whatever, but I want to get minutely like minuscule here. What are you most afraid of? And then they'll tell me. And then I'm like, okay. And what do you most want? Because that's the guarding of what's, what they most want. And what the most want is, I believe, is their deep desire that has been a gift given to them. Because I believe we're all unique, made like no one in all of eternity, for all of time and where we are in our world, for us to be the beautiful being that we are. And I believe those desires and talents and passions are a gift to us. We don't even go get them. They're just, they're just in there. Mm. And I don't believe that we're called to do something through us. If we don't have a passion and desire, it matches. Like it's a joy to us when we're in that space. So when there's this wanting inside, we don't have to be saying, oh, I'm being selfish. No, no, no. That's the gift. That beautiful gift, that wanting, that desire is like, oh okay, well, if I open to love in that want instead of fear and it's not going to happen, what if love were here now in that want? What might that look like? I'm curious, what are, what are some of the reactions from, especially in the corporate world, CEOs, leaders mm-hmm. of C-suite, what are, they, what are their reactions to these sort of questions? What are, are, they, are they receptive to this more heart-centered, uh, you know, channeled, type of type of path or is or do you find there's a lot of resistance there what's what's been your experience Mm -hmm. thank you very mixed um i would say the older generation even older than me this is my experience not a judgment um they're less open to really taking it in for themselves. They've run so fast and so hard and so far down the road. Now that's not always true. I have been working with someone who's 70 years old and has an amazing business. Um, I have found that once I get in with their being, their, who they are and what, what's their suffering really, if they're willing to be open, then they're going to get it. But it's, I've got to meet them and their suffering. And not always will they want to go there because it takes a stillness and a, and, and a, not only a want, do I want things to change, but a willingness. And there are a few that are willing. There are a few that are willing or they'll only get so far in their willingness. Mm. And then fear takes over. Oh, well, my team or blah, 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 or whatever it is. But there are some that will, and it's helped me to realize too, I only want to be with those that are truly willing. And for me to feel into that and listen to that. And I know more and more people are waking up, especially from the pandemic. Um, People are talking now about well-being in the workspace because people are like completely stressed out and like, oh my gosh, right? I'm home and my kids are here and 
I'm not with my people anymore. There's so much loss, but then there's also so much more stress. And now they're talking about well-being, like it's something we got to supply to my people. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> that's not how it works. How about you being the one that models it? How can you be the one that takes care of your well-being? What would that look like? Uh, what would that look like? And, and, and your openness is going to, your vulnerability, because they don't want to be vulnerable. That's what they think. They've got to be the strong person. That vulnerability is inviting and it invites the others to come and be in your space, right? So we have those discussions around vulnerability. Um, I work on the Enneagram. I don't know if you, we talked about that. Um, so I very much use that as a tool because the, our type and our Enneagram is our delusion. It's our crazy that we run. <laughs> and so I'm a three and threes and eights tend to be the leaders of corporations. And it's just, they're crazy running them. So it's, we have some fun around that and they're willing to see that to some sense. And then others I have to say, there are a few CEOs that continue to peel back the onion, that continue to peel themselves back, that continue to know that they're more than leading the corporation to a result. And I always say to them, no matter who, where they are in their journey, what are the results you have in your life? Are you achieving what you most want in every area, wealth, relationships, love, your health, where are you not? And then they'll tell me. And then I said, you're committed to that. And they look at me like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, you say you want this, but you have that. Your results never lie. So you're committed to that unconsciously. Right. So can we peel back the onion and look at your beliefs, your hidden barriers that are keeping you from what you most want. And so my work is how do I wake up these people if they're wanting to come with me, I should say, from excellence to genius. And very few people will ever get to genius, their purpose, their calling, their passion. And because the fear is so great to make that leap to genius, it's more comfortable for the ego to stay with what it knows. Yeah. Right. And so the coaching has always been around, can you love yourself and accept yourself in the fear? Can you breathe with it? Cause it is two things, fear or love, or that's it. Fear or love, you know, anger and sadness come under fear. It's fear first toxic fear. Right. And so can I just notice the one in me that's frightened and can I give that one some tender space? And we do talk about those things. Can I give myself some tender love? And usually they're like, I don't know what that means, but I'm like, okay, well, let's just practice. Let's practice what that means. Can you just give yourself a little bit of capacity for that? Mm. And a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I love where this is going. Um, I, I don't think I've ever sort of looked at it that way, but it's what, what you're describing is what are the being aware of the unconscious beliefs that are keeping you in your excellence, knowing that if you stay there, it's, what's killing you and why is that because you're being called to more you're being called from your genius uh, you're being called from your excellence into your genius which brings up a lot of fear mm -hmm. my question is why is that why do you think it brings up so much fear and is that do you think it's designed that way do you think it comes up for any particular reason well <clears throat> i think it's we're all created with this brain, right? We already know about this, the ego, the amygdala that wants safety first, safety first. And safety means it knows. It knows what's going to happen and it doesn't, it limits us. Like it only even likes us to have so much joy because that's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. it, it only wants us to have certain things. It doesn't want to be stretched because it's uncomfortable with the unknowing. So it's whoop. Well, you know this pattern. And so because we're asleep at the switch, most of the time, the patterns that run in our brain, right? What we think is what we feel is what we create, which leads our results. So if we're thinking, thinking, thinking 95% of the time and we're unaware and their safety, their safety features are safety features like our seatbelt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I've still, I've got, I've got some, you know, we run on adrenaline and we get a temporary hit from the, the gold stars we get. And it feels good. It feels good. It, if, if it, 
didn't feel good, we wouldn't stay there. So we get addicted to excellence. We get addicted to the hits. We get addicted to them, just like cocaine, whatever it is. But it's waking up to seeing, wait a minute. This is killing me. This is exhausting me. It's getting me so far, but I'm in, I'm in this spiral. I'm in this spiral. And again, it's scary to step most. How many people do you know, Tyson, that say, yeah, I love doing this, or I'd love to be here, or I'd love to create this, but they never do it because of what? They're fearful. So can I love myself in the fear? Can I love myself? And the change formula is you step anyway in the fear. You take the love and the fear there. You hold them in both hands. Okay, guys, fear and love, let's go together. Because if you allow love to come, guess what? Love always wins. If I ask, what does love want here? We're always going to choose love. Mm. So can I just step with both of them? Can I just step with both, even though there's fear? Just try it. And again, that goes to what I had said earlier twice. It builds a capacity to allow fear to be here and still step forward. It's like me racing my bike. Every time I'd go to the line, I'd be shaking in my boots. So is everyone else. You're shaking your boots a little less because you get more used to it. You know it's going to be there, but you step, you go anyway. And then once I started pedaling, the fear left me, right? And so if we're called to something, if we're called to our genius, that's going to take over the fear because we're going to be so aligned, head, heart, and gut. We're going to be like floating and things are going to happen through us. It's going to be easeful instead of manhandling it and exhausting ourselves. It's what, yeah. what you're describing is what I call the flip. It's like when you're living in your excellence and you're living in uh, what will help you strive to achieve, you basically, what you're describing is what's stopping you going into your, your genius and your calling is that the excellence piece is safe and it's familiar, right? Even if it's uncomfortable, even if it brings up stress, even if you have fatigue, it's familiar, Right. And so a lot of people can say, yeah, but that's safe. But here's what I, here's what I've known to be true is that it's safe to your mind, but very uncertain to your heart. That's why your heart's saying there's a different path for you. There's something different, but we're told to follow our, our head. But when you take that leap, what you describe, when you just start pedaling and you, and you start reaching that space, it's very scary to the mind this time but very safe to the heart, right? You, you take your leap, but what you develop is the, the knowing that as long as I'm following my highest excitement and as long as I'm following my, my genius and my highest calling, my heart's calling, it feels scary to the mind. You're like, what the hell's going to happen next? But for some reason, it feels safe in the heart. It's like, I am just following the reason why I'm here and I know that I'm going to learn the lessons I'm, I'm meant to learn and receive the high level opportunities that my mind can't see. So that's what I I, call the flip. I love it. Okay. So I just want to say a little more about that. This is so awesome. So this is exactly right. So the reason we are stressed, you already know this, I'm sure. The reason people say are stressed, they think it's from outside. If I do less, no, no, no. Stress is because we are not listening to head, heart, and gut. I call it dissonance. Are you a music person? Um, let's say no. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Well, dissonance is that sound that scary, like grating sound that you hear at the movies and you know, something bad's going to happen. It's like, you know, that sound you're like, and your hair stands up. That's what we do in our bodies every day. The dissonance, because we say we want one thing, but we have another Mm. that right there is dissonance. It doesn't align when head, heart, and gut don't align dissonance and the stress comes inside and it creates this great on us, just like a scary movie sound. Soon as we shift and take the step into, can I listen? Would I trust my gut and my heart? 
Would I trust my body and what it's telling me? Would I trust my heart? Guess what? Headaches are going to go away. Blood pressure is going to go down. Cholesterol is going to go down. Cancer is going to start to be, I mean, it is everything that changes in our being when we're aligned. And guess what? We move from dissonance to harmony. Harmony with ourself. Harmony with who we are and what we're called to do. And then we get our matching of what we want. What we say we want is actually what we have. It's the only mm -hmm. way. If we don't align here, forget it. And we can, we all know when we're not, when we're at stress, it's a, another thing. Oh, can I check myself? Feeling stressed, where am I not aligned? Can I check in with my heart and my gut and my head? Can all three things align? And I shared this with you, I think before, and it's on my website. If it is not a whole yes, head, heart, and gut to you. We have to slow down though to do that. We have to be with ourselves and sit with it, not just like running like we always do. Can I take some time to be with myself and ask, do I have a whole yes with this? Check in with my body, check in with my, my heart, check in with my head. Even if it's like, yeah, 97% yes, it's a no. Mm. It's a no. Cause you know, you know this, when you've got a yes, your whole body goes forward. You're like, yes, I'm doing this. But if you're like, I don't know, your body does this. It kind of squirms back. It's not running forward. It's not leaning forward. And if it's a no, you're like, mm. I would love for you to watch people. You guys watch yourself, watch each other. I'll tell people if I ask them something and they do this, I'll tell, I'm like, nope, you have a no. Mm. I'm not going to agree to a decision or a process or someone if they pull their body back. Their body is the first thing to tell them it's a no. Well, when you say that, I imagine to go back to your story, I imagine yeah, yeah. everyone on the, on the train platform going yeah. to work and watching hundreds of people as the train doors open, their body goes back a little bit and then they push it to go forward. I can just totally. imagine watching that, you know, cause their body's telling yeah. them this isn't your highest calling. Right. And they're just there yeah. they're, and, and that's just what came through my mind as a little bit of a beautiful a and not and not only that are they just stepping on the train they're hurrying to get in before the doors close quickly mm. and then they're stuck in this container yeah oh my gosh with everyone else with everyone else and then they get off with their heads hanging with their briefcase or their whatever we wear backpacks now i mean how many joyful people do you see walking to work mm. I don't know too many joyful people. And that's my, my whole thing is I ask leaders, I'm like, who's the most joyful person you know? Who is yours? Do you have one, Tyson? Uh, if it's not myself, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 probably my, it's probably myself, to be honest. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Uh, I love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love that. I've never heard anyone except for you say it's you. <laughs> I live, but I live by myself. I work by myself. I, I'm, I'm literally by myself. I have a, I have a very, very joyful family. And I think, um, I think that's just the, I'm very blessed to have that environment. Um, but like, even with my twin brother, hang out with him. Um, I used to live with him. We just have the best time. It's like, we just think like life's a playground, you know? And if you can, mm. if you can bring joy, if you can bring joy to any situation, no matter what's happening in your circumstances, if you can bring love and joy, I think like, what else is there? You know, you just see something that's beyond your circumstances and what's happening. There's just a deeper depth of life. I find. I, I agree. I love that. And, and when I ask people who is the most joyful person, you know, they'll stop and think, maybe they'll come up with someone else. Sometimes they're like, I don't know anyone. Mm -hmm. And then I ask them, why is it not you? Yeah. And then they're like, oh. And you're right. It's like, why are, shouldn't life be abundant and joyful and, and, and creative and fun? And who doesn't want that? Yeah. And the cool thing is we can choose it. We can choose it over and over and over. And as soon as we see that we're not, oh, I can go back. To, I can choose joy. I have the power in my thinking to choose it. Over and over. As soon as I find myself going down the slippery slope, oh, can I give myself love? That's just my fearful one. Oh, come back over here. I'm going to give you some love. Just get back over here. 
<laughs> it's really, that's, that's what it is. Can I come back? Can I come back? Can I come back? And, and so much happens in joy, right? The, the manifestation of joy and the connection and the overflow of that's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's what we're, it's what we're truly after. We, we think like, that's why we wanted to achieve in the first place. We thought it would bring us more, more love, more joy, more peace. Uh, yeah. When you realize you can have, you can live that way now. I, I believe achievement comes to you. Success comes to you and your goals chase you instead of you chasing something else. I think that's just, it's just what happens. I mean, someone can probably try to prove me wrong, but if you're truly in your heart living the way you want and you are what you're after, mm -hmm. then the, uh, you know, the world works in crazy synchronistic ways to just allow your life to be amazing. And that includes some of the painful lessons, you know, and you can yeah. see through that it's not meant to happen. And all these, you think everything's happening for a reason. Everything's happening for me. Even if my mind can't see it, I think those deeper truths and that wisdom follows you the more you follow your heart. I think that, that you just awaken to that sort of thing. Is that what you found? Absolutely. Absolutely. As soon as now that things aren't a loss ever for me, it's never a loss. It's like, oh, cool. Something greater wants to happen here. Something greater wants to join me. Something greater wants to come through me. Something I just haven't seen it yet. So I get excited because it's got to be pretty amazing. Cause I thought the other thing was pretty good. This has got to be like even better. Yeah. <laughs> right. Cause I can't, I can't make it up in my head. Doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. Right. And, and I love that. Like the whole, like in, the intention of, well, something is there. Then you know what, when you believe it's there, something awesome's there, guess what's going to happen. You're going to see it. You're going to create it. You're going to know those people. You're going to you're going to be open to it. You're going to be looking wide eyed when you're fearful. You ain't looking anywhere, but this, mm. when you're depressed and stressed, you're just, where are you looking? Right? So joy, like, and people know when you're joyful. I walk down the street here in Nashville, smiling. I tell myself to smile, even if I don't have that energy right there, because that brings whole serotonin, you know, emotions going on. Smile. And guess what? People smile back. They want to smile, right? And then there's more energy share, just the little things like that. Yeah, it's so true. And it's like you said, it's a conscious choice you can make in every moment. So if someone, if someone here is on that path, they're like, oh man, I'm, I, I could be stuck in the achieve phase. I might have some unconscious beliefs that I'm, I'm unaware of and I want to get more on a path that's heart centered and towards my heart's calling. Where, where can they find out more about you? Where can they find out about mm. what you do, some content that you create, all those, all those different things? Yeah, thank you. So my website is a great place to look. Um, it's www.sunderland, S-U-N-D-E-R-L-A-N-D, -E coaching dot com um that's one way or um deborah d-e-b-r-a at deborah d-e-b-r-a sunderland s-u-n-d-e-r-l-a-n-d dot com my email email me guys um and then i also put a quiz out recently for people to start to look at am i overachieving and what am i overriding by doing that by getting things done so i put a quiz together it's like three minutes uh, to take it. It's called Beyond Doing. So two Ds together, beyondoingquiz.com. Uh, and you take the assessment and then you can connect with me around that and we can go over it. But I have tons of tools, tons of options, one-to-one -one coaching, group coaching, forums, retreats, all kinds of stuff. Because I want people to have this. I want people to live the life they most want to live. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me here. No problem. It's been a pleasure. I, I love this topic. Um, I want to talk to you more about this, about this offline as well. But when you have, when you, when you're on this path, things happen and mm -hmm. your mind can't see it, but your heart will feel it. And I, I, mm -hmm. I urge anyone who wants to dive in deeper, reach out, reach out to Deborah. No doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be some tools, some tactics you can implement in your day-to-day -day life. And start mm -hmm. making more conscious decisions. Start being a leader in your life and, and, mm -hmm. and, and living from a place of love, living from a place of joy. Uh, Deborah, is there anything else that you want to add? Any wisdom, parting words that would make this, uh, make this conversation feel complete? 
Yeah. Well, I love that you just said leadership, right? Everyone thinks it's a title or a, leadership is exactly that. It's how are you leading yourself? How are you showing up in the world? Are you consciously or are you in a coma? So I love that. So, and just to love yourself right where you're at. Just, I said that before, but guys, just love yourself right where you're at. You are enough sourcing your love. You have it right now. It's not out there, believe me. And um, yeah, just love yourself. Beautiful, beautiful. Deborah, thanks so much for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.